I am so glad you are here today because I want to welcome you to this wonderful day. This is called Zman Semchateno. It means the time of our rejoicing. So everybody here today, I hope you ha are in a rejoicing spirit because that is what we are called to do today, is to rejoice. And uh, today, of course, we are celebrating Chag HaSukot, which is the, uh, the Feast of Booths. And uh, I uh, hope that uh, we will enjoy our time together at the conclusion of the message. And uh, we're, we're going to do some things outside that, like, uh, we're going to take a uh, family picture. So I hope you brought your big smile with you today as well. We're going to do that. And uh, I, I, you, know, I, you might wonder, you say, well, wait a minute now. Uh, you know, Sukkot, why is it called the time of our rejoicing? Why is it called Zman Semchateno? Uh, is there any, any reason specifically why we call it that? Yes, there are three times in Scripture. This happens to be the only one of the holidays in which God commands us, not once, but three different times, to rejoice in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, we read, And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So I hope you're going to be here for a while. <laughs> you plan to be here, bring your, a few things for dinner, and, uh, because you're supposed to rejoice for seven days. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 14, God says, And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son, and your daughter, and your male and female servants, and the Levite, and the stranger, and the orphan, and the widow who are in your town. Everyone, in other words, is included in this and, in, and commanded to rejoice. And it's repeated again in the very next verse in Deuteronomy 16, verse 15, so that you will be altogether Joyful. God wants us to be happy today. He really does. And there is a wonderful reason that we are going to look at why we should indeed be very happy on this celebration. Now, <clears throat> Sukkot is an historic holy day, some, a day that, uh, that has its roots back in the Scripture from... Uh, 3,400 years ago. So we know it's historic. But do you realize that not only is it historic, it is also prophetic. You see, when, when I was growing up and these, uh, these holidays were uh, explained and, and uh, we celebrated them, the first part of this is what we celebrated. But we missed the prophetic nature of it, which is really a shame because that's, that's what makes us even more joyful, as you will find out this morning and as we look through some of the scriptures that uh, deal with this holiday. First of all, I want to clarify one thing. Uh, the, uh, the words that are used for this uh, holy day, Sukkot is the uh, Hebrew word, and that's, of course, what we all call it in Hebrew, Sukkot. But uh, the, uh, what does Sukkot mean? Well, Sukkot in Hebrew is a, a word that means the temporary, the, the temporary fragile huts that were constructed out in the fields during the harvesting times so that when farmers went out to harvest the crops, they could perhaps take, get some shade during the heat of the sun if they were out there, take a break, or even spend an evening in the, the sukkah so they'd be able to get up early in the morning when it was cooler, perhaps, and harvest the crops in the early morning or in the late evening and stay overnight. So sukkot literally means booths. However, you, you also hear it called tabernacles. And you see I have a little unhappy face next to that tabernacles. That's usually a tip-off. <laughs> because 
The word tabernacles actually is a translation of, uh, of another Hebrew word called mishkan. Uh, it would be mishkanim because it's a, a masculine. Um, and the mishkan is a word that in the scripture that is used as a, a portable dwelling place. And it's a word from which we get the word shekhinah. You've heard the word uh, shekhinah, the uh, visible presence of the Lord, the dwelling of the Lord as he uh, came and appeared on earth and in the Tanakh. We know of a number of times where that happened. But um, the word uh, tabernacles is really, really focuses on the temple that was uh, carried around during the 40 years of the wilderness wandering. And that was called the Mishkan in the text. It is the, uh, was carried around before the first temple building itself was actually constructed in Jerusalem. Because once, a, uh, once the temple was set up, it was no longer called a Mishkan, a temporary dwelling place uh, for God. So when you hear the, uh, the holiday, think of it not as the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, but rather, more correctly, the Feast of Booths, which is, uh, as you know, I hope you know, one of the appointed times and I gave away the, uh, the, the chapter where you can find them, but by now everybody here knows what chapter to go to to find these appointed times, right? Got it right. How did you get that? Okay, Leviticus 23. Here are, now, can you name, let me, let me in your mind, not, not, don't, don't kind of offer these out loud because we'll, you know, we'll be, who knows what will come out. <coughs> the... Um, the seven appointed times. So I'm going to go through them in the order in which they appear in Leviticus 23. And of course, the first one will be, what is the very first appointed time that's in Leviticus 23? Does anybody know? Shabbat. Shabbat. Good for you. You guys, you know what? This group is getting an A today. I am excited about that. Shabbat is there because that's the eighth of the seven uh, appointed times. Uh, but after the Shabbat, the beginning of the year is at the Pesach because God denointed that one and said, this is the, shall be the beginning of months for you. Right? And he, uh, he called that. It was in the Passover, Pesach. On the very heels of Pesach is another separate feast which begins the very next day after the, uh, the Exodus basically began, uh, which is called uh, briefly Chag uh, Matzot uh, or just Matzot, meaning unleavened bread. And we all look forward to that, don't we? <laughs> don't look so excited, but it's not matzo today, so you can still keep smiling. Then comes the, uh, the Feast of Bikurim, which means first fruits. And uh, 49 days and, uh, uh, after we come to uh, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, then comes... Yom Teruah. It's not Rosh Hashanah. Biblically, it's called Yom Teruah for a very good reason. It's not the new year. It's the day of trumpets. Day of trumpets, and it's there for a reason. Five days later comes Yom Kippur, which we uh, observed. What's that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> 10 days, right. Um, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And today is not the Day of Atonement. Today, five days after that, is uh, Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. Now, each one of these, not just Sukkot, but each one of these is both historic and prophetic. I have gone through the, uh, the prophetic nature of the other uh, holy days on a number of other occasions. So if you missed that, you should have been here. <laughs> Don't miss it next time. Today, we are going to look at the, begin with the historic nature of the holiday we call Sukkot. Now, you may recall hearing about something in Hebrew called the Shalosh Regalim, which means the three legs, literally. It has a regal is the Hebrew word for leg. 
It means the three walking holidays, the three pilgrimage holidays, where you were supposed to appear in Jerusalem. And the other two, of course, are Pesach and Shavuot, and the, the third one being Sh uh, Sh uh, Sukkot. So today is the third of the three Shalosh Regalim. Remember, all men were supposed to come and appear at the temple, but they were not to appear empty-handed. They were to bring something to give to the Lord. And when you think about that, why did God require them to go to the temple? As a reminder to come back to him. Literally, set aside the things in your life and come back to him, focus on him. God is very, it's very interesting to think about it because God wants us to not just know about these things, but to do them. Because if you really want to cement the understanding and the remembrance of, of what the, uh, the holy days were all about, doing them is the way to do that. Otherwise, it just becomes head knowledge. And you know, if you have children, as we've raised children, Sukkot was one of the most joyous holidays in our house. Why? We built a sukkah every year. And it was always a fun time in our backyard to build the sukkah. They looked forward to it. And our kids have been raised with that to this very day. They remember that with good thoughts in their minds. And if they have room, the days will come where they'll be building their own. Now, right now, their kids are so small, it's, uh, it probably wouldn't, uh, they probably wouldn't be of much help, you know, at two years old. Go get the sukkah, uh, Emily, uh, Millie. No, probably not. They will. But um, this holiday has a dual significance for individuals. First of all, it is a reminder. It's an agricultural. It has like agricultural origins. It, it reminds, in fact, they called the Chag uh, Asif, the, the, the ingathering of the, uh, of the crops at the very end of the agricultural year, which is the last harvest now in the, uh, the month of October, or September, October time frame, end of October. But the second one is that it's a, uh, we are to dwell in these temporary booths in order to remember some things, things that God wants us to remember. And one of the things he wants us to remember is those 40 years of wilderness wanderings, which now God is not a God of punishment without reason. But there are consequences to our decisions of things we do and things we don't do. This is part of what God wants us to remember. What happened to the people who refused to enter the land, to trust God and enter the land when they first arrived at the borders of the promised land? Well, they spent 40 years dying in the wilderness because of that. And they themselves, the adults, never entered the promised land except for two. But during that time, while God was angry at them and punished them, literally punished them by not allowing them to enter the promised land. You know, you don't hear very often where God punishes people. You think, well, he disciplines them. You know what? This was a punishment. This was not to teach them something. They had already missed it. But it's to teach us not to be like them. And during that time, God could have had them die in the desert. And I was just talking this morning uh, with uh, Jesse and a few others before the service about how God teaches us things through difficulties. But he provides for us in the midst of the difficulties. Do you remember the part, and this is, this is uh, kind of off track here a little bit, but I, I th it's kind of an important one. Do you remember when Moses 
was frustrated by what God wasn't doing for the people and, and the people were frustrated at Moses. And God was so upset at the people. What did he threaten to do? Do you remember? He said, I'm going to destroy these people. He told Moses, you know what? I'm going to wipe these people out and we're going to start again from you. What about that? And Moses said, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Is that what Moses said? No, what did Moses say? He said, blot my name out of the book of life before you do that. May it not be that the world hears the God of Israel who was strong enough to remove the people under the outer slavery from Egypt and then killed them in the desert. What will that mean to your name? Moses was so worried about that. He said, I'd rather be blotted out. Don't do that, please, Lord. And it said that God changed his mind. You know what? God didn't change his mind. Why did God tell Moses he was going to do that? He told him that so that you and I would learn about the heart of Moses. The humblest man on earth, the scripture said. Moses cared about the people of Israel. God was never going to destroy them. He relented, he said, because he knew that, M that Moses would pray that they not be put to death. And so God spared, as was his plan, the children of Israel. And he provided for them, despite all the things that he knew they were going to do. This year, we, as part of the remembrance, we wave the lulav. And why do we wave the lulav? To remember that God is good, and his goodness is forever. He provided then. He's provided for you now, I see, because you're here today. And he's going to provide for you tomorrow. You can count on that. God will provide. He is a good and faithful provider. And we wave the lulav, thanking him for his goodness. Ongoing provisions. He's not done with you. Thank God. Now, we're going to take a look at some of the texts that deal with the historic uh, nature of, the, of this uh, holiday. There are three areas in Scripture that touch on it. Leviticus 23, verses 33 to 43, that's 11 verses. And then in Numbers 29, there's another 29 verses. And then in Deuteronomy 31, beginning at verse 10, there's another four verses. The grand total of that is 44 verses. So let's take a look at that. Oh, you can't see it. Oh. Yeah, it's a lot of verses there, 44 verses in all. Well, we're not going to read them, fortunately, three. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, I do want to point to some things about this uh, holy day, which you may or may not be aware of. We know already, based on the list that I presented a few moments ago, that it is the seventh of the seven appointed times of the Lord. It occurs in the seventh month, which, by the way, is not called Tishrei in Scripture. It's never called that. The word Tishrei no, appears nowhere in Scripture. It's not a word in Scripture. The word that uh, God used, actually it appears in First Kings, is etanim. So anybody who tells you, tells you that's the 15th of Tishrei, say, ah, let me, uh, let me correct you on that. It's the 15th of Etanim. And they'll say, what? And then you can begin a discussion as to why it is the 15th day of the seventh month, Etanim. And this is an interesting uh, holiday, holiday because it is, 
It is one, the, uh, the celebration lasts, as, you sa as we said before, for seven days. I like parties, that, uh, but a seven-day long party, that's a long one. But after the seven days, God is not done. He's defined yet another day, and he uses a different day for a meeting. The word that he uses there is not a chag, like a festival that he uses here, but the word atzeret. Atzeret is a Hebrew word that means a solemn day. And it's on the eighth day, Yom Shmini. The eighth day, Atzeret Lachem. A, a solemn holiday you shall have, from which we get the wrong Hebrew English name called Shmini Atzeret, which is bad Hebrew. We get a Hebrew lesson here this morning. It's not, there is no word. Shmini Atzeret is not a Hebrew construct. construct. It should be Yom Shmini. Yom Shmini is the eighth day, and you're to have an Atzeret on that day. So I'd like to propose that we all rename the ha that eighth day just Atzeret. And then uh, somebody says, Shmini Atzeret. No, 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 that's not right. You can tell them why. Go look in the Hebrew. Um, so there's a solemn assembly day called Atzeret uh, that uh, follows the seven days. And there's another uh, day that uh, follows even that. So for a seven-day holiday, all of a sudden, it grows into eight or even nine. That last day is called, we, uh, the rabbis have called Simchat Torah. And we are going to be celebrating that next Shabbat. So you came to the right season if you came to Ben David during, uh, at this time of the year. It lasts for the seven days, and there are supposed to be many offerings every day. Every day there are supposed to be seven days of offerings. And uh, including the eighth, actually, that uh, Solemn Assembly Day, the total number of animals that the scripture requires to, for sacrifice is uh, 199 animals. Now, that was for the nation, not for each person. Otherwise, there'd be no animals left in the land. You remember, you're supposed to live in booths all seven days. And in the seventh year... Everybody is to stand for the reading of the Torah. That's a long stand. Right. And you know, the reading of the Torah, according to the text in Deuteronomy, says you shall read it not for you, just for yourselves, so that the children, your children will hear and they will learn to fear the Lord. And what do we do? Well, we take our children out so they will hear. And they're learning in Shabbat school right now. We're in the youth group. Children are learning to hear the Lord. And they, you know what? You are doing a mitzvah if you are bringing your children here that they may be taught on Shabbat. They may not remember everything that is taught in their Shabbat school each week, but they will remember that they came for Shabbat school they will remember they had a good time doing their learning, but maybe they don't ha remember all the things, but it'll be enough to trigger some things when they get older. And they'll say, oh, yes, I remember learning about that when I was young. Let me go look that up again and, and see what the Scripture says about that. And things will return. Because when you bring them here on a regular basis, they will retain it. They will retain the sense of what happens on Shabbat, where they belong. You know, if you look at these, uh, this list, you notice right away that there's a lot of sevens having to do with Sukkot. And as you may well remember, what is seven? The biblical number for completion. This holy day is the completion of all the holy days. You ought to expect something very special about Sukkot. And you will hear about it in a few minutes.
let's look at the prophetic nature of Sukkot. I said it was historic, and it's also prophetic. In order to do that and look at the prophetic nature, I've selected four prophecies from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Tanakh. Four uh, prophecies that deal with Sukkot and its relationship with the city of Jerusalem. These prophecies have come from four different of the well-known prophets of Scripture. From Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. All well-known prophets, I hope. Well-known to each of you. Let's begin with Isaiah. I'm going to share a prophecy from Isaiah that has to do with Jerusalem and its connection with Sukkot. And in each of these, each of these uh, prophecies that I'm going to share, I will list the year in which it basically, uh, when the prophet presented that. Now, we don't have the exact years, unfortunately, when they wrote, because many of them wrote over a series of time, you know, a period of time. We know the general years. We know the, the time frames in general in which they, they wrote. And Isaiah wrote, beginning in about 700 BCE, before the Common Era. Chapter 2 of Isaiah, verse 1, begins with this. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem happens to be in Judah. But it applies, apparently, to more than just Jerusalem. In verse 3, and many peoples will come. Watch what this is saying. And many peoples will come and say, it's a prophecy, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And where is that? In Jerusalem. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. This, this, this could make a nice song. Chuck, this could make a nice song. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Why? That he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. Now, just a minute. I thought God was omnipresent. He's everywhere. Why do we have to go up to the top of some mountain just to hear him? Does that make sense to you? You know why? Something special is happening at the top of that mountain. This prophecy is more subtle than meets the ear. More subtle because it implies you're going to have to go and hear with your ears in person. Oh, what's going on up on the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob? Well, many people will say that he, if we go there, he will teach us his ways. You know what? If I didn't know better, I'd think God was up there. Why else would you have to go? Hmm. This is concerning Jerusalem. For the law will go forth from Sion, from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. My goodness. A prophecy about God being in Jerusalem? Now Jeremiah, about 100 years later from Isaiah, and it shall be in verse, chapter 3, verse 16, it shall be in those days when you are multiplied. <laughs> You're a small nation now. And uh, when you are multiplied and increased in the land declares the Lord. Well, what, something's going to happen in those days. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. What is a throne? A place where a king sits. What do you think? I think this is saying that's where God's going to be sitting. God sitting? And all the nations will be gathered to Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. They will literally come. Ezekiel, chapter 48, verse 35. 
a few years later. 580. The city, that is Jerusalem, is in, in discussion in this text. And it gives the dimensions, 18,000 cubits round about. But it goes on to say, and the name of the city from that day, whatever day it is that Ezekiel is prophesying about, from that day on, the city shall be known as the Lord is there. You know, I see a pattern here. Do you see it? All of these scriptures are telling us something special is going on in Jerusalem in this prophetic day that God will be in Jerusalem. Zechariah, the last of those four examples, a few years later, after Ezekiel, sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Can it be any clearer? All the nations that went against Jerusalem in this day that God is talking about through Zechariah, in this day, all of them who went against Jerusalem will go up to Jerusalem from year to year. Well, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. They're going to go up to Jerusalem year to year? Why? Was he there once? Did he make an appearance and then disappear? He's still there. And what are they going to do in this prophetic day? What are they going to? It says they're going to celebrate something. Yes, they are going to celebrate the Feast of Booths, the very holy day that we are celebrating today. Something special is going to go on. Let me just summarize for you what we've seen in these texts. That Jerusalem will be called the mountain of the house of the Lord. And that the word of the Lord will, will come directly from Jerusalem. It'll be called the throne of the Lord. It'll be the place where God himself, the Lord, will, will dwell in the midst of the people. And they will say that the Lord is there. And all the nations will go up to Jerusalem. Especially on the Feast of Booths. Now, you didn't have to go all the way up there this year, did you? You came here instead. Wouldn't it be nice if, if we could all get on a plane and head to Jerusalem and the Lord would be there? He'd probably do a better sermon than I would. I'm with you. You see, Sukkot Future is talking about Yeshua coming and dwelling with us. You see, that's... That's the person of God that we get to see. Is the Son of God. We don't get to see the Father or the Spirit. Those are not visible to us, but we get to see the Son. And He came in the fullness of God and dwelled for a short period of time, but then left. But He will return, folks, and He will not be leaving after that. I just want to close Noting this, it really struck me as I thought about this. You see, we all know that Sukkot is both historic and prophetic. But it's prophetic because it symbolizes the ultimate goal of Scripture. This is the completion, the culmination of all of Scripture. What, Doug, could that be? This came to my mind. The creation of Adam painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. For those artists among you, something special is going to happen. It was actually pictured here in a way. This was the creation. But you know what? On Sukkot, will be the restoration of the relationship between God the Creator and you and I, His creation. 
a relationship that was broken by sin. And remember Yeshua's words. Words that we, if, if there is anything that should make you happy, these should. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. You are going to be in the presence of the Lord. And you know, folks, I can't think of anything more joyous to look forward to than that. You ought to be excited about this. <laughs> because we are going, we are going back into the presence of the Lord physically. Not just in spirit, which is wonderful that we have his spirit, but we are going to dwell with him. That brokenness that happened in the, in the garden is going to be permanently and healed when you're in his presence and you will experience that and you will dwell with the Lord and that's what Sukkot is all about and you know folks it is a reason to be joyous let's pray Heavenly Father we rejoice at this time knowing what the future holds for us yes we go through difficulties here on this planet Lord, we are such broken creatures ourselves, but Lord, this is a time where we can focus on what, what you have done and what you are going to do for us. And we look forward, Lord, to that time when we will be in your presence. May we be encouraged this day to put aside all the things that tend to drag us down. Lord, those will disappear from our memory, Lord, because we will be enjoying your presence. What a day that will be, Lord God. And we give you the praise and the glory that we can rejoice in that even though it hasn't come yet, we can look forward to it because we know your word is trustworthy. We know we can, it is faithful. We know we can depend on it. And so, Lord, today, let us truly rejoice and give you all the praise in the name of our wonderful Messiah who made this possible because of his gift, his sacrifice, that we might be cleansed and atoned for and be allowed to be in the presence, made clean that we might be in the presence of the Lord himself. And we thank you in his precious name. Amen.